Two special guests joining in on the show this evening. Jayant Sinha, Member of Parliament uh, uh, and a representative of the BJP and uh, Subir Gokhan, Director at Brookings India and former RBI Deputy Governor. Uh, Jayant, I want to start with you. The Prime Minister is meeting some of the most powerful global CEOs, you know, from Eric Schmidt to Jeff Emel, to name it, and he's meeting them all. What is going to be his pitch? I think he's going to say what he has already told us, which is come to India, make in India. Uh, that India is open for business, that India is very, very interested uh, in uh, attracting foreign investment like he has shown in Gujarat, uh, and that we would like to be able to see large-scale investments in manufacturing and in infrastructure that will enable us to uh, build up the infrastructure that we so desperately need, while at the same time creating lots and lots of jobs in construction, in manufacturing, uh, and in other ancillary sectors. So that's really going to be his pitch, which is come to India, make in India, and create jobs in India. All right, come to India, make in India. That's the big uh, hard sale pitch. Uh, but uh, Dr. Gokul, do you believe the American audience will be wooed by this? Are they willing to buy that very hard sale pitch? I think, uh, well, we have uh, a, a major announcement tomorrow, uh, I understand, uh, with the unveiling of the Come Make in India uh, program or initiative. Uh, I think the important thing uh, when you're doing a sell, you're trying to sell India as a destination for, for uh, to locate production facilities, uh, is what are you doing domestically uh, to make that pitch credible? Uh, so we have a whole bunch of things that uh, investors have, not just foreign investors, but domestic investors also, have, have had trouble with, uh, whether it is infrastructure, whether it's labor regulations, the, the whole Inspector Raj issue, land acquisition, the sort of unpredictability of, of other regulations. All of these are things that, uh, that the government has to fix uh, domestically uh, in order to raise investment. And it doesn't matter whether it's foreign investment or domestic investment. So I think what this kind of messaging does is to uh, put more pressure on the government to act quickly and effectively on addressing these domestic constraints. So that sense is not, not, uh, you know, an, an, uh, uh, not necessarily uh, an out of sync kind of proposition. Uh, what you're doing domestically is really what is going to add credibility, provide credibility to the message abroad. So you can start selling, but eventually you have to, not, not eventually, sooner rather than later, you have to start delivering with domestic reforms. And if you're putting pressure on yourself to do those domestic reforms, I think that, that works uh, to the benefit of investors. Mr. Sinha, if I may bring this to you, India and US have recently been at loggerheads over multiple trade-related issues. At the core of all of that is perhaps also the immigration reform that the US is pushing very hard. Uh, do you expect Prime Minister Modi to really take it up or raise it strongly with President Obama in his meetings? Well, I think you have to look at the entire America-India trade relationship in context. Immigration is a very important aspect of the relationship, but it is, I would say, one of many, many different elements. There are very important partnership elements in this relationship associated with climate change, for example, associated with foreign direct investment, associated with pharmaceuticals, associated with civilian uh, use of nuclear energy. So we have to look at all of those different elements of the relationship. Now, what will happen in any negotiation is that there will be some give and there will be some take. Now, where the give and take is going to be is going to depend a lot on the domestic agenda of both the two uh, heads of state, uh, for Prime Minister Modi as well as President Obama. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that as the full package is put together, there will be some progress on the issues that are of great importance to India, which, by the way, includes not just immigration, it includes the social security money that's being put in by Indian workers working in the U.S., and it also includes the WTO. So exactly how the package is going to end up looking like once uh, you know, it's settled, it's hard to predict, but I'm hopeful that some of the elements that are important to India uh, will get uh, the attention that they deserve. Chant, you know, India's protectionist stance on the trade facilitation agreement has also been criticized quite strongly by the U.S. Uh, will India be willing to recalibrate its position? And if not, could it be a deal breaker? 
Well, I would not at all characterize it as being protectionist. Uh, I think what we're trying to do as far as the WTO is concerned uh, is to come up with a balanced agreement that is fair to all sides. We have said that we are very much in support of the trade facilitation agreement. And in fact, we are already starting to take action on some of the trade facilitation measures unilaterally. We are going to start to do some of that uh, in any case. Uh, but at the same time, what we are saying is that as you're pursuing the areas of, of importance that are for you, which is trade facilitation, you also have to at the same time pursue the areas that are of interest and importance to us, which is on the food stockpiling side. So I think what we need is a balanced agreement that takes into account the interests of all parties and is not just uh, one-sided or focused just on the interests of the developed countries, not on the interests of the developing countries. Now, on the developing country side, I would like to emphasize one important point is that no other developing country has food stockpiles at the scale that India does and would be distortionary if indeed they were released in, uh, in global markets. So in a way, India is kind of unique in this situation. And so it makes it all the more complicated because in some ways you can isolate India on this issue. All that being said, it is a matter of equity for developing countries and for the developed world. And that's why I think it's very important to come bring in place a balanced agreement. So again, I would say that I would reject your characterization of it being protection. This is really just a fair agreement between parties on the one hand that want trade facilitation and parties on the other hand that want to make sure that they have food security for their population. Dr. Okun, let you have the last word then. Uh, you know, no matter what Mr. Modi says, at the end of the day, things need to change on ground. You know, for India's potential to translate into performance, political and bureaucratic obstacles, they need to be addressed. We need structural reforms. Uh, are, these, uh, are these challenges surmountable? Are you hopeful that we'll see action on these fronts? Well, that's, that's, the, that's why we have governments. That's why we elect governments to fix these problems. Uh, when we started to fix them in the early 90s, it took us a while to get uh, the critical mass of reforms in place. But when they fell into place, we really saw the benefits you know, unambiguously with the kind of growth acceleration we had in the early 2000s. Uh, now we've hit a different set of constraints. We, we have a food uh, inflation problem. We have an infrastructure problem. We have a job generation problem. All of these, I think, are challenges which uh, the government has clearly recognized as priority and is looking at ways to, uh, to, to address them. So we, we, we've seen some action on the food front, uh, at least through the sale of, gray, of uh, stocks, uh, rice and wheat, which has had an impact on food inflation. That's not a long-term solution, but it is a starting point. We've seen, uh, 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 so we, we're seeing, I mean, tomorrow we'll let's wait and see what happens uh, on, the, on the manufacturing strategy. Uh, if, if there are concrete uh, proposals there to, uh, to address some of these constraints, uh, we're starting to see some uh, movement on land acquisition. All of these will be debated, there will be resistance, there's no question that that's the way we work. But I think we've got to see some forward progress. And once we reach a critical point, a, a, a threshold or a tipping point, if you want to call it, then everything starts to fall together, to come together. And I think that's uh, the kind of uh, uh, response we saw in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, and we have to re replicate that. I think that is, uh, that is the important message here, that is you can't do one thing at a time. You have to do a number of things simultaneously in order to create the, uh, the right environment for investment to surge. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.